What's a little bit frustrating here, and actually there were several questions uh, addressing this point is, but where is this inequality coming from? Why is it that we have an equal or an unequal distribution within the income? Uh, one thing we've seen on, the, on, on, the, on actual data is uh, we, we do find that in some couples uh, uh, that, that, for instance, the, the state of the marriage market as, um, as a proxy by the sex ratio has an impact on the, on the, um, on the intra-household allocation. Why that? What's, what's the theory? How do we understand those kind of phenomena? So the, the goal of this, uh, of this second part will be to present models that are aimed exactly at addressing this. So in, in a nutshell, the first part of the talk, I, there was a decision process that I was considering as exogenous. Now I'm trying to endogenize it. Essentially, there will be two questions. One is, who marries whom? And by the way, we're going to talk about divorce. We've been talking about divorce law. So the, the question is, another question will be, who divorces whom? And the second one is intra-household decision redistribution of power, and in particular inequality. We want to model this as an endogenous phenomenon. That's something which is, which is pinned down by equilibrium conditions. Let me say right away that uh, this is new. The start of the type of literature. All the papers I'm going to talk about are less than, except except for the for the the, the fundamental ones, uh, are were written during the last ten years and many of them during the last five years. But it's a booming literature, so there are plenty of, of aspects, and I won't have time to talk of uh, about all of them. So I will try to concentrate on on some of them, but 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 I will try to select some I find quite significant for the kind of issue that we're talking about. Essentially, there are three basic tools. And I'm going to talk only about one of them. Uh, you can use matching models. You can use search models. Or you can use bargaining theory. Now, bargaining theory, I'm not going to talk about bargaining theory. Bargaining theory is, essentially, you got a couple, and you assume you model the decision process as a bargaining game. In, you, in general, you will use uh, cooperative game theory. Uh, so, and you will use concept like usually Nash bargaining could be Kalex Borodinsky, could be something else. Uh, now, of course, you got the usual problem with bargaining. Uh, barg the outcome of the of the of the bargaining game depends on the on the threat points. So, what do you take as the threat points? You you need to take some methodological issues. And by the way, there are very interesting problems linked to that, which is what can you identify? For instance. Uh, take all the models that I was talking about in the in the first talk. Those were models in which I was assuming that um, that the, the allocation was efficient. Now I want to be a bit more specific. I'm assuming that the allocation is efficient, and that in addition is the outcome of a Nash bargaining game. Is there any kind of additional restriction coming from this uh, Nash bargaining assumption? There, there is a literature like this. We have, we have, there are papers on this. I'm not going to talk about this just for the, for the sake of brevity. I'm going to concentrate on equilibrium models. So is there a matching or search? And actually, I will concentrate on, on, on matching. Again, it's not because I'm not interested in search. Actually, I've, I've written models in search. And there is very interesting research in uh, using search model in, the, in family economics right now. Uh, let me say a few words about the, the relationship between matching models and search models. Let me take an analogy. Assume you're interested in a question like, what would be the impact of a war in Iran or some serious trouble in the Middle East on the price of gas? As an economist, the way we, we think naturally about this is, well, that's a supply shock. So the supply curve will move. Assuming that the, in the short run, the demand curve is constant, then there will be a price effect, there will be a quantity effect. And how much price, how much quantity depends on, on elasticities. And then in the long run, uh, there might be an adaptation of demand. There will be investment, and so on and so forth. Right. This is what I would call a frictionless equilibrium approach. Now, I'm making a bunch of assumptions when I'm saying something like this. 
Actually, when I'm drawing a demand curve and a supply curve, I'm making a bunch of assumptions which are not realistic. For instance, I'm assuming that there is one price of gas. We all know that there are a bunch of different prices of gas. You buy gas, gas in different places, you won't pay the same price. And that's because there is uh, horizontal differentiation, there might be vertical differentiation, uh, there may be asymmetric information. Uh, at the very least, people don't know uh, the price of gas at all places. And even if they knew there is some kind of the, the horizontal differentiation story, there will be some cost. You're, you're not going to go to go all the way to uh, Evanston to buy if just because the gas is uh, is five cents a gallon cheaper, and so on and so forth. So in reality, there are plenty of frictions. But when I'm doing, uh, when I'm drawing my supply and demand curves, I'm assuming away the frictions, and it's a very it gives us a very good first approximation of what's going on. Not the way you should think about the difference between matching model and search models. Search models, in a sense, are much more realistic because we know that there is that there is search on the labor market, uh, there is search on the marriage market exactly in the same way, and it's not that you immediately meet your best match and you may have to wait, and there may be mismatch and so on and so forth. But at the first stage, we might disregard those frictions. Now, there are two things that for which you need search models. The first thing is, there are some situations in which you're essentially interested in frictions. For instance, if you're a labor economist and you're interested in unemployment, well, you know, at least part of the unemployment is due to friction on the labor market. So if you're interested in unemployment, you wouldn't use a frictionless model. And the second thing is, you may, even if you're not interested in, in the friction themselves, you're not interested in the unemployment part, but you're interested in who's match with whom, so which kind of workers go to which kind of firms, Still, you may want to use search model if you're interested in the dynamics. Those, those kind of, uh, the kind of frictionless model, they tend to be static. They do quite well from a static point of view. But the, but the dynamics, you have, if you have to impose the dynamics on the, on the top of it, essentially it will be a search type of, of dynamics, and you will go back to search. What I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate on frictionless model, the matching models. Uh, and again, it's not because search models are not interesting, but I think it's a natural first step, and then you can you can continue uh, on in the in, in the other direction. Uh, we only talk about couples. You can use exactly the same tools to talk about fertility. Uh, I'm not going to do that because I don't have time. And I'm going to mostly talk about transferable utility. Now, this is um, mostly, but not only. But this this I will be a bit more precise about this. OK, that's what I'm planning to do. Let me start. But uh, how many of you are familiar with matching, with matching models in general? OK, so not everyone, obviously. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a brief summary of match, ma matching models. Uh, so apologies for people who are already familiar. You will hear things that, that you already know, but you know that's always good. Uh, and I will try to be brief on this. On the other hand, if you're not familiar with this and something sounds unclear, please interrupt me because it's crucial that, that we're completely at the we, we're, we're, we're completely at, at the same uh, at the same point uh, on on this. Essentially, there are three types of models. And by the way, a, a source of confusion, big source of confusion here, is that the the way those models are called is completely misleading. The standard distinction between in, in matching theory is between non-transferable utility model and transferable utility model, which seems to suggest that you're either in a non-transferable case or in the transferable case. That's completely wrong. Non-transferable utility is a very specific case. Transferable utility is a, also a very specific case. And I would say 90% of the, of the most reasonable models are in, in some kind of third case, which I call imperfectly transferable utility case. Uh, so that, that's the first point I want to make. And let me be a bit more specific. Now, what's non-transferable utility? And I'm talking about the, the strict non-transferable utility models. I'm talking about Gale Shapley. I'm not talking about recent developments like uh, Kelso Crawford and all the literature starting from this matching with contract, Milgram or Hartfield, uh, uh, Scott, Commoners, which, which I think you're, 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 and so on. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about Gail Shapley here. 
Gail Shapley, the matching model, I like Gail Shapley, is very simple. You've got two populations, let's say men and women, could be workers and firms, could be anything, but men and women. If you match one particular man with one particular woman, there is the utility he derives from that, there is the utility she derives from that, and there is no technology that allows them to transfer utility between them. So there is no way, it's technically impossible for him to decrease his utility in order to increase his partner's utility. Why would he be willing to do that? Essentially to attract the partner, but that's, that's assumed to be impossible. That the non-transferable utility stricto sensu, that's Gail Shepard. Transferable utility make exactly the opposite assumption. You can transfer, but not only you can transfer, but you got some kind of perfect technology that allows you to transfer at an exchange rate which is exactly equal to one. Now, what do I mean by exchange rate? Essentially, transfer means there's, there are ways for me to decrease my utility and to increase my wife's utility. Now, the technology is such that I, if I decrease my utility by one unit, and unit being utile, right, in this kind of virtual unit by which we measure utility, it so happens that I'm increasing my wife's utility by exactly one unit. Now, that's a huge assumption. That's a very, very strong assumption. Because the point is, this exchange rate, you have to be a bit careful. Of course, the definition of the exchange rate depends on the particular cardinal representation of utility that, you, that, that you're choosing. But the point is, the technology should work for any prices and income. So the life is such that, utilities are such that, the Pareto frontier is always a straight line with slope minus one. That's a transferable utility framework. Again, that's a very strong assumption. And then you got the third case, which is what I call matching under imperfect transferable, imperfectly transferable utility, which in a sense is a general case. And it's a case that tells you, on the one hand, you can transfer. So it's not the case that there is no way for me to decrease my utility and, 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 and increase the utility of my wife. But the exchange rate is not always equal to, uh, to one. There are some situations in which it costs me a lot of, ut of utiles to increase my wife's utility by one utile, and in other cases, it's much cheaper. So essentially, what I'm saying is, the general case is, there is a Pareto frontier. Transfers mean there is a Pareto frontier, and we can move along the Pareto frontier. On the other hand, this Pareto frontier needs not be a straight line. Now, what you immediately realize is that if I want the, the Pareto frontier to be a straight line with slope, a minus one, whatever price is an income, I will need assumption and preferences. I will come back to that. But the general case will be something like there are transfers, but not the transferable utility in the strict sense, because there is a Pareto frontier, but the slope is not minus one. Is that clear, this, this distinction? Now, it so happens that the matching under transferable utility, despite the fact that it relies on very strong assumption, is very widely used because from a technical point of view, it's infinitely easier than, than, the, than the imperfect transferable utility. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk essentially about the technology using transferable utility. And at the end, I will mention the prog recent progresses in which you're using imperfectly transferable utility. And I, will, uh, and I will show you that it's feasible. It's a bit more complex, but you can do things. Questions? OK. Let me briefly, just to conclude my presentation, uh, cover some similarities and some differences between those three types of models. What do we want to explain, first of all? All those models we want to explain who marries who. But that's not the most interesting thing. That's not the reason why I'm interested in, in those models. The most interesting thing, which is the last two, that's not the case of MTU, but with TU and ITU, we also explain how the surplus is divided. And that's crucial because I remember what, what I had in mind, uh, my motivation when I started my, my presentation was to say, look, we take a household, there is a distribution of resources, a distribution of power, an inequality within a household. I want to, to endogenize it. Well, those models do exactly this. They will endogenize, they will allow me to endogenize the distribution of, uh, of resources within the household. So that's exactly what they're going to buy me. By the way, 
NTU will never buy you that. Because NTU, you're assuming that there is no transfer. So how much she gets and how much she gets is, is part of the definition of the game. It's not something that comes out as an outcome. The setting, the setting is pretty much the same in both, in, in, in the three cases, in the sense that we have two population, and what we meet is we, we match one person from, from one population to one person to the other population. You can think of different matching games. Uh, an obvious one is one to many. When, you, when you're matching firms with workers, it's not one to one, it's one to many. Uh, but you could have also the what's called roommate match, match, matching. In other words, instead of matching people from one population, one person from one population to one person from the other population, you could have matched within the within a given population. So it could be same-sex couples, but it's also be uh, it could also be you know business business partners. You got people who, who, who form teams or who form uh, I don't know firms, a relationship, business relationship, and so on. And and this is within the same population. I'm not going to talk about any of this. I'm, go, I'm, I'm going to talk about the bilateral, so it will be men and women, essentially. Now, if you want to define the matching game, you need to define the two population. You put a measure on each population. And then in the NTU case, you have two payoff function. Because in the NTU case, you match, say, how much whenever, for every marriage between Mr. Mrs. I and Mr. J, you need to say how much Mr. Uh, Mrs. I gets and how much Mr. J gets. In the TU, you just need the total surplus. And the way they so your size of the cake, they will generate together. But the way it's going to be shared is endogenous. And in the ITU, it's even more complex because, because it's not a number. It's a, it's a shape. It's a very tough frontier. In all cases, the, the equilibrium concept is stability. I'm going to be more precise in my definition. But stability essentially is robustness vis-a-vis -vis, uh, bilateral deviation. So the yeah, matching is stable if. A, you cannot find a married person who would rather be single. And B, you cannot find two persons who are not currently married together and who would both be better off being married together than their current situation. And their current situation may be they are single or they are married with somebody else. That, that, if this happens, that's a violation of stability. <clears throat> what TU buys you, I will be more precise in a minute, but TU buys you a huge thing, which is stability is equivalent to, to the maximization of aggregate surplus. And that's immensely useful for a bunch of things. Now, as I said, I'm going to concentrate on transferable utility. That's the technical definition of, uh, of uh, transferable utility. A group satisfies transferable utility if you can find a monotone transformation of each individual utility such that, so you can find a particular cardinal representation of individual utilities, such that for those particular cardinal representation, the Pareto weight is a straight line with slope minus 1, whatever price is in income. That's the definition. <clears throat> uh, now, what are the properties? A property of this model, I will be a bit more, uh, I will be a, a bit more um, specific about this, but the minute you're assuming transferable utility, you're making a very strong assumption, which is the aggregate behavior of the group does not depend on the distribution of power subsidy. Let me restate that. Take a couple. Think of a couple. The, the, the couple assume that the couple is making efficient decisions. In all those models, decisions are efficient, by the way. Uh, all those models assume efficiency. So in general, there is something like a Pareto frontier, which is the sets of, of, of pairs of utility that they could achieve. In most models, different points on the same Pareto frontier correspond to different aggregate, demand, aggregate behavior of the couple. So if you take a couple with a given income and you change the, the Pareto weight of the husband and the wife, so you move the point on the Pareto frontier. Essentially, what you're going to do is you're going to change the structure of consumption. And maybe there will be more public good consumption when you give power to the wife and more private consumption when you give power to the husband or whatever. That's not the case with transferable utility. I will be more specific in a minute. But you must remember that a typical property of transferable utility model is that the aggregate behavior of the couple 
does not depend on the greater weights, on the power, on the intra-household distribution. So in those models, you've got a very clear-cut distinction between the aggregate behavior and what's going on within the household. The aggregate behavior is completely driven by efficiency. On the other hand, the, the inequality, what's going on within the intra-household distribution of resources, this is driven by the kind of, uh, of uh, uh, equilibrium condition that we're talking about. Now, that's the general theory. Let's, let's, let's talk a bit more about the, 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 the marriage market example. So we take a standard collective approach on the type I was describing before. You take two agents with their own preferences. You take efficient decision. What do you need exactly to assume on utilities to get this transferable utility property, to get this property that the Pareto frontier is always a straight line with slope minus one? This is what you get. Those are the utility functions that will give you transferable utility. And this has been derived by Bergstrom and Bergstrom and Coates in, in two important papers. So that's what's called the generalized quasi-linear uh, utilities. So forget about the FI. The FI is just there because transferable utility is an ordinal property, so you can always transform any utility function by an increasing transform, and you don't change anything. And look at what's inside here. I have private consumption. Those are the small queues. I have public consumption, that's the capital Q. And by the way, the lower index is the person consuming, the upper index is the index of the commodity. So that's this guy here is the, community, the, the consumption of commodity number two by person I. Note that this AI function can be anything, but it does not depend on the first private good. The first private good is exclusively here, and the first private good is multiplied by a function which only depends on public consumption. That's one thing you need. And in addition, you need this function to be the same for everyone. So in other words, I have a restriction on the shape of preferences. And in addition, I have a restriction on heterogeneity, because it must be the case that not only everyone has, has a preference of this form, but the B function is the same across individuals. AI can be completely different across individuals. Why do we need that? Well, essentially, remember, I need to be able to transfer an exchange rate of one. What I'm going to, the way I'm going to do this transfer is by trading commodity one. Now, assume that I'm giving that the husband is giving one unit of commodity one to the wife. Is utility loss is this B of Q here. The utility gain, the marginal utility gain of the wife is also this B of Q. And since his, his B is the same as her B, we got uh, what, she, what he loses is exactly what she gets. So that's, that's not very surprising, but that the, that the result. Let me, know, let me mention a few things. First of all, it's an ordinal property. Transferable utility is not a cardinal property. It's an ordinal property. We got restriction of preferences and heterogeneity. <clears throat> so as I said, all Pareto efficient allocation is the same aggregate consumption. Why that? Because efficiency is equivalent to just maximizing the sum of utility. In general, Pareto efficiency is the maximization of a weighted sum of utility with the Pareto weights. With transferable utility, it's not the case. With transferable utility, Pareto efficiency, and, non and uh, uh, positive consumption of, the, of good number one, means that you max Pareto effic efficiency is equivalent to the maximization of the sum of utility. And it's very easy to, to, uh, to show. So essentially, what you're maximizing, so the aggregate behavior is the solution to this maximization here. Now, in particular, uh, the household behave as a single. Now we have in, in this model, you know, I made I made I made a big deal about there is no such thing as the preference of the couple. Well, this is the preference of a couple, and it's a standard utility function. This is a model in which actually the couple can be represented, can be modeled as if there was a single decision maker. Uh, the the household aggregate behavior only depends on total income, of course. Uh, the consumption of each spouse, in particular the consumption of commodity one varies. So there is an equality in this model. But the equality concentrates on commodity one. So in a sense, there is a, a dichotomy between household aggregate behavior and intra-household allocation. And now there is this notion, which is the surplus. Now, remember, with those kind of utilities, the shape 
of the vertical frontier is a straight line with slope minus one. So the only thing I need to know is what's the intercept. Well, the intercept is this guy here, is the surplus. So essentially, the story is you put those two people together, they generate a surplus, and the surplus is just the value of the program which is here, which is this maximization under the budget constraints. Note that this surplus, let, here x is the income of the husband and y is the income of the wife. Note that the surplus only depends on the sum. And the value of this program will be the surplus. It's the size. So essentially, in this kind of model, you match two people, they generate a cake, the value of this program is the size of the cake, and then they, 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 they split the cake, he gets something, and, he, uh, and she gets the, the size of the cake minus this something. The, 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 the sharing is completely there. Now, just to give you that this seems a, a lot uh, very theoretical, but these, those are utility functions that we did use in a paper with uh, Morati, Igun, and Joram Weiss. Uh, and you know this is not crazy. This is a, a standard Cobb Douglas utility. So he has a Cobb Douglas utility. She has a Cobb Douglas utility. This is a transferable utility model. Uh, any efficient allocation, the consumption of public good will be x plus y plus one plus a divided by two, and the surplus will be the total surplus will be uh, this animal here, which is quadratic. Now, uh, so essentially, what you see here is. There is a bunch of different Pareto efficient allocation. They all have the same public consumption, but of course they have different level of private consumption, which is in a sense exactly what we're interested in, right? We're interested in, in inequality. Now, uh, all Pareto efficient allocation have the same level of public good, so we can disregard this, uh, but they differ by their private consumption, and that's exactly what we call inequality. In some of them, he gets a lot, she gets very little. In other, uh, they both get the same. And that's that the, the natural way of thinking about intra-household inequality in this context. Questions about this? Next, let me come briefly to uh, the theory, the, uh, the abstract theory of matching models under transferable utility. So that's what, what used to be called Becker Shapley Schubik, so it's as opposed to Gil Shapley. The structure is actually uh, quite general. You have two spaces that the set of men, male characteristics, let, let's say x is the set of female characteristic, y is the set of male characteristic. We have measures f on g. This could be multidimensional, by the way. A characteristic of a man could be uh, education, uh, income, uh, age, uh, why not physical attractiveness, whatever. But in principle, those models can be multidimensional. When, you, when you, you have a function S, which is the surplus, which is the size of the cake they generate when you match Mrs. X with Mr. Y, the only thing I need is some weak continuity property. I need it to be a person who continues. Now, what's a matching? A matching is the measure on the product space and two functions. Now, let me explain that. The measure tells you who's marrying a woman. So essentially, uh, I have a measure H, H and you can think of h of x, y as the probability that Mrs. x is married with Mr. y. Now, in general, the probability will be 0, 1. So the Mrs. Mrs. x will marry one particular Mr. y with probability 1. But it's not always the case that there are situations in which actually the solution involves randomization. So we want to be completely general. So it's a measure on the product space, but there is a restriction on this measure, which is that it's a measure on the space of couples, but if you integrate over uh, with respect to women, you got the distribution of men. And if you integrate with respect to men, you got the distribution of women, which is exactly decided at the marginal of this measure of the initial distribution on the space, on the male space and on the female space. And a matching consists of two things. This measure, which tells you who's married whom, and also two functions, which tells you when people are married, at least married with positive probability, how is the cake shared between them? So u of x is how much Mr. X will get, Mrs. X will guess. V of y is how much Mr. Y will get. And the condition is that if you take a couple on the support of this measure, meaning if you take a couple that are married with positive probability, then it must be the case that what she gets plus what he gets is the total cake. So that the Pareto frontier being a straight line with slope minus one. That clear? Now, what do we call stability? Well, it's the, the, the definition is the usual stuff. 
It cannot be the case that two people who are not currently married together would, would both like to be married together. And it's very easy to see that this is equivalent to this inequality here. Why that? Well, assume that this inequality is reverted. Assume that this sign here, instead of being larger than or equal to, is strictly smaller than. What does it mean? It means that in the current situation, Mr. Mrs. X is getting U of X, Mr. Y is getting V of Y, but by marrying together, they would be able to generate a cake that would be larger than the sum of their current shares, which means exactly that they should marry together, and there will be room for bargaining there uh, in such a way that both of them will be better than in current situation. But that would be a violation of stability, so this cannot happen. Is that clear? Again, that's the standard definition of stability, and the interpretation is divorce at will, if you wish. Just for one minute, completely forget this notion of stability and think of a completely different problem, which is surplus maximization. So, and that's, the, the, that's quite important in mathematics. It's, the, it's a family of mathematical problems which are called optimal transportation problems. Uh, it's, it's no problem, actually. It was first raised by a French mathematician named uh, Monge sometimes in the 18th century. Uh, and it's quite, uh, it's quite relevant, actually. Uh, you might, if you are interested in mathematics, uh, the, in the, among the recent field medalists, there were four field medalists um, in, the, in, the last, uh, in the last award. And one of them, Cédric um, uh, Villani, actually has worked a lot on optimal transportation problems. And he has written a, a book, which more or less the Bible of the, the new versions of optimal transportation problems. So what's the structure? The structure is exactly the same. I have those two spaces, women, men, and I have a surplus, which is upper semi-continuous. But now I'm not looking at all at stability. I'm asking the following. What would be the way of matching men and women so as to maximize total surplus? So if I take any matching, I take any man, I randomly assign this man to a particular woman, I can compute the surplus they generate, and I can add up all their old couples, and that will be the the, the, the aggregate surplus, and the question is, is there one way of matching my men to women so that the total surplus is maximized? Now, the main result is, now first of all, note that this is linear programming. This problem is a linear program. Remember that the unknown here is the measure. What I'm maximizing here is linear with respect to the measure, and the condition on the marginal is also linear. With, with respect to the measure, so it's linear programming. Now, the cool thing with linear programming is that we can use duality, and this is the dual problem. The dual is find two function u of x, b, and y, and solve the minimization, which is here. f and g are the initial measures of the two population, and they're the constraint, which is here. And what you see here is just the stability conditions. Actually, the main theorem <coughs> underlying all this is a matching is stable if and only if it maximizes total surplus. Now, I was saying that this is immensely useful. Why that? Well, think of problems like existence. Existence of a stable match is a very difficult question in general. Because, you know, you're, you're, is it the case that can you always find functions that satisfy this bunch of inequalities? It's not obvious. Well, actually, it so happened that in the, in the bilateral matching models, it's, it's very general. Uh, and it directly comes from actually Kelso Crawford. Uh, but it's very easy to write problems which are very close to the matching models in which there exists no stable match. For instance, take what I call the roommate problem. Assume that you want to match people two by two, but within the same population. It's very easy to find examples in which there, there exists no stable match. Now, in general, proving the existence of a stable match is a very difficult problem. But not here, because stability is equivalent to surplus maximization. So proving existence is equivalent to proving the existence of a solution to a maximization problem. And this is a piece of cake, actually. The assumption, you need very simple, you need separable metric spaces, you need some compactness uh, here, and you need the kind of, of uh, continuity which is there that's sufficient to show existence. Uniqueness, it's almost impossible to show uniqueness of a stable match in general, but here you can easily show generic uniqueness. It's very easy to derive, because it's, it's 
is the uniqueness of the solution to a maximization problem. And those are things that we know how to do. So this is the main theorem. Uh, we got exist and generic uniqueness. The sets can be multidimensional. I never ever say that anything was one dimensional. Most of the example I'm going to talk about will be uh, one dimensional. But here, if I have time, I will say a few words about multidimensional frameworks. Uh, and there is a natural extension to hedonic models. So um, this I'm not going to talk at all because it has nothing to do with uh, with inequality. But uh, you know this uh, this conference is. Uh, uh, this whole program is co-chaired by, by Steve and by Jim Hackman. So since Jim Hackman is in port, I needed to talk about the hedonic model. And actually, if you take the, the hedonic model a la Ekman, Ekman, Nesheim, uh, uh, and so on, they're completely part of this framework, and they all this framework applied to them. And those are theoretical models that give you a precise description of the mathematics of this. Actually, let me forget about it. The last thing you need to know about the general theory of matching models is the notion of supermodularity, which sometimes called complementarity. Now, what do I call? Now, remember, the, the basic object in those matching models is, is this surplus function. It's the size of the cake that, that Mrs. Um, X and Mr. Y are generating. What? Now, here I'm one dimensional. From now on, I'm assuming that X is one dimensional or Y is one dimensional. Then in that case, I can define supermodularity, and this is the definition of supermodularity, is the usual one. If, uh, if x is larger than x prime and if y is larger than y prime, the surplus I'm generating by matching the high people together and the low people together is larger than the surplus I get by mixing. Are you familiar with this? You know, that, that standard you get that in contract theory, and by the way, uh, if those stuff are twice continuously differentiable, this is exactly Spence Morley's. Is that the cross, the second cross derivative of S has to be positive? Now, if this is the case, matching is assortative. In other words, we know exactly what the single match looks like. The wealthier man is married with the wealthiest woman. The second wealthier man is, is married with the second wealthiest woman, and so on and so forth. Can we generalize to multi-dimension? Yes, but it's technically a bit challenging, and I won't, I won't talk about, about this at that point. I may come back to that later. Now, here is the main result, and here is the reason why I, I like so much this kind of model. If you take a discrete number of agents, there is uniqueness of the measure, but there is not uniqueness of the utility. But the basic result, let's assume a model in which I have a continuum of agents on each side. Then the intramatch allocation of resources is exactly pinned down by the equilibrium condition. So what I'm telling you is the following. Give me the distribution of men, and it could be multidimensional. Give me the distribution of, of female characteristics. Again, it can be multidimensional. And let's assume that this that, that distribution are uh, completely, absolutely continuous, atomless. OK? And then give me the size of the cake, which has this very weak uh, continuity property. Not only I can tell you who's going to marry his womb, but I can also generically tell you exactly how the surplus will be divided within each cup. Now remember, that's exactly my initial motivation. My motivation was, can I endogenize inequality within the couple? This is exactly the kind of tool that will give you this, because that's exactly the kind of tool that tells you, if you give me the, the characteristic of the population, here is how this, the cake will be divided. And more importantly, if I change some of the characteristics, here is how the division of the cake will change. So if I change the sex ratio, here is how the distribution of the cake will respond to those changes. Is that clear regarding the motivation? Because that's, that, that's the crucial thing, that the reason why we want to go through those models, and there is some kind of technical investment, as you've seen, but what they give us is they give us the intra-household allocation as the equilibrium outcome. The definition of the equilibrium tells you not only who marries who, but how the, the cake is shared in each and every couple. Now, this is a very strong result, so I don't want you to take my word on this. I'm going to show you how it works. And actually, the, the, the nice thing is that it's 
very easy. I'm going to do it in the one-dimensional setting, although you can do that in a multi-dimensional setting, but let me do that in the one-dimensional setting, and let me assume, just to make my life easier, that S is supermodular. So who's marrying whom is pretty, is pretty easy. I got authority matching, and the wealthiest man marries the, the wealthiest woman, and the second wealthiest man marries the second wealthiest woman, and so on and so forth. Then three steps. Now, first of all, I know who marries whom, right? That's, that's this, uh, exactly what I told you. Now, in practice, what does it mean? It means the following. It means M Mrs. X is married with Mr. Y if and only if the number of women who are wealthier than Mrs. X is exactly equal to the number of men who are wealthier than Mr. Y. That's exactly what this condition is giving you, and that gives you the function. Now, take any change in those distribution make women wealthier, make women poorer, increase their number, decrease their numbers, you will, you will have the changes quite quite um, easily, and you will know what, what the impact is on who marries But again, I'm not that much interested in who marries I'm much interested in how is the cake shared. And now you will see it's, it's, it's very simple. Look at this condition up there. That's just the stability condition. Remember, the stability condition tells me that u of x plus b of y is always larger than s of x, y. So if it's always larger, it must be larger than the max. But sometimes I have an equality, because if x, uh, if x and y are married together, then I have an equality. So I know that u of x plus b of y is exactly, is exactly equal to the max of s of x, y, which I can write that way. And I know exactly when the, the, the max is reached. The max is reached when I take for y exactly the husband of Mrs. X. Now this, if you assume continuous distribution, u of x is a continuous function, you can get, you can prove or assume that is differentiable. You need assumptions, of course, on s. Essentially, you need at least differentiability on s and a, and a bit more than this. Let me skip the details. But just look at this. You can write the first order conditions of this maximization problem, which gives you this. Or you can use the envelope theorem and just remark that the, the, dif the differential, the derivative of u with respect to x is just the partial of s with respect to x, taken at the point at which the maximum is reached. But the point is, given this function, now remember, s is given by the, by the definition of the problem. And this psi guy here is given by the fact that there is a sort of match. So if you give me the distribution, I find the psi. And if you give me the s, I know this. And then I know the utility function up to an additive constant. And by the same token, I get the utility function of the husband up to some additive constant. So the utilities are defined up to two additive constants. Well, it sounds a little bit like the previous story, except that I can do better. I can also pin down the constants. How do I do that? Well, first of all, I'm using, I know his utility, I know her utility, but I also know the sum, which is, which is the, the surplus they're generating. So this pin down the sum of the constant. And let's say that one gender is in excess supply. So let's say women are on the long side of the market. There is an additional condition which pins down the constant, which is if there is an excess supply of women, then there will be, some women will be left unmarried. But competition between women means that the, the, the last married women must be just indifferent between being married and being single. Because otherwise, the, 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 the first single woman would bid, and that, that due to the continuity, uh, would outbid the last married woman. So you just write this, this indifference condition, and thus pins down uh, the distribution. Let me, so this sounds a bit theoretical, but let me give you a, a Mickey Mouse example that tells you that even if you take the, the very general model, you got a lot of mileage from this some sort of remark. Look at this assumption here. Remember that F is the distribution of female characteristic and G is the distribution of male characteristic. And let's keep the interpretation in which uh, the, the characteristic is income. So that's the, income, the male income distribution and the female income distribution. Uh, those can, what I'm assuming is the distribution of uh, the, the female distribution can be deduced from the male distribution via a transformation like this. Which means essentially, if you, uh, if you want, uh, for instance, let's assume that both distributions are normal, then it works. 
assume that both distributions are log normal, which makes more sense if we're talking about uh, about income. Well, it's the same. It, uh, it's, it, it works if the sigma parameter is the same. So essentially, it's it's a, it's a restriction on the distribution, but it's not a very strong restriction. What this buys you is that the, this phi function the, is is linear. So if you want the relationship between the income of a, of a wife and the income of the husband is a linear relationship. By the way, you could deduce that from the shape of the distribution, or you could just postulate this. Now you just write down this kind of equation. Remember that in my model, the surplus function was a function of the sum. You do that, and you got this very simple integration, which tells you what u of x is and what v of y is. Essentially, let, let's spatialize a little bit this definition by assuming that mu is 0 and lambda is, is something less than 1. So essentially, what I'm telling you is the distribution of male and women is such that uh, if you take any decile, the, the income of the woman at this decile is exactly lambda times the income of the men at the same decile in the male distribution. You know, so the distribution of women is the same as the men, except that, by, except that it's scaled down by a factor of 0.8 or 0.7, something like this. With this kind of stuff, this gives you a closed form solution of the way the surplus is shared. And essentially, this H is the total surplus. So essentially, Mrs. X is marrying with Mr. Lambda X. And uh, she gets 1 over Lambda plus 1 of the surplus, and he gets Lambda over Lambda plus 1 of the surplus. Now, in this interpretation, if, if men are wealthier than women, Lambda is larger than 1, so he gets a larger share of the surplus. Using this, you can do comparative statics. So what if you scale up the, the female income distribution? Assume that I take each and every woman in this distribution, and I multiply the income of this woman by a factor A, which is larger than 1. Now, first of all, I'm not changing who marries who, because I have authority matching, and since I'm not changing the order, I, uh, the, I'm not changing the, the, uh, the, the, the couples. But of course, I'm changing the incomes of the couples, because now the same uh, the same guy is married with a slightly wealthier woman. What's the impact? Well, there are two impacts. One is, for each any, any given couple, the, 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 the pie is larger. But just because he has the same income, but she's wealthy. So the pie is larger. There is an additional pie. And this additional pie, this additional slice of pie is shared between what she gets and what he gets and what she gets in the usual way. He gets lambda and she gets 1. If he gets lambda over lambda plus 1, she gets 1 over lambda plus 1. But in addition, there is a redistribution, and that's just because the nature of competition has changed. And so in addition, she gets an additional lambda over lambda plus 1 squared times h, and he gets minus this. So that's a transfer which is due. So what, you, what we have here in this very simple closed form solution is Take, a, uh, take a distri an income distribution on the male side, an income distribution on the female side, uh, and assume that you increase only all female income by 10%, which, by the way, is pretty much the story that took place in the US over the, large, uh, over the last uh, 30, 20 or 30 years. This must have an income on each household distribution. And this tells you, yes, it does. And here is a kind of back of the envelope computation. Here is the additional, there is a, a larger pie, so the, 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 the additional gain is shared. But in addition, there is a distribution, and you've got a very simple closed form solution for that. I'm not taking this model seriously. This is a very Mickey Mouse model. As I said, in a minute, I'm going to show you more serious models in which we, we want to, to be a, a little bit more specific and a little bit richer in the kind of framework that we're considering. But that's just an illustration of my, my initial claim, which is take those kind of models. Question like, what's, what, how is the, the, the cake shared between the husband and the wife? I have a very simple answer right away uh, with very simple computation. Look, the, the most technically sophisticated computation I, I did was putting, a, I had a, a derivative and I put an, integrate, uh, an integral sign to get the function. So it's completely straightforward. Any other questions about, on this? That the theory is a bit dry, but at the background, and then we're gonna we're gonna apply that. As I say, it's a recent literature, but there are a bunch of papers doing this. 
There is a paper using this kind of matching models to explain abortion. And now the question in those kind of models is, uh, as you know, uh, abortion was legalized in the, in the, in the US by uh, Supreme Court judgment, Roe versus Wade. Um, and there, uh, 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 a kind of claim that you find, in particular in the feminist literature, is the legalization of abortion has led to uh, what's called female empowerment. So the situation of women within couple has been fostered by the legalization of adoption. And a student of mine, Sonia Rifice, who is now at, uh, in Europe and in Alicante, wrote her PhD dissertation exactly on this. So what she did was the following. She used the same kind of models that I was describing, the labor supply models that I was describing before. And she was saying, look, this is a distribution of factors. you got states in which abortion was illegal, comes the Supreme Court's judgment, abortion becomes legal. Uh, let's look. So if we believe that this led to an increase in the power of women and a decrease in the power of men, well, this should be translated into labor supply in exactly the same way as the sex ratio or the laws of divorce were in the previous model. Except that in the previous model, it was something like, uh, like a reduced form. Here we have something like a theory back in that model. So her dissertation was an empirical work doing this kind of stuff. And she found, and she was using the fact that uh, some state legalized abortion before the Supreme Court did. So there is some kind of identifying power here. And she did find that, indeed, uh, she saw, on average, that legalization has the, uh, a positive impact on women that you could measure looking at labor supply. The, during the defense, so the committee the, consisted of Steve Levitz, Gary Becker, and myself. And during the defense, Gary raised a very interesting point. Gary said, wait a minute, what is the theory? You're telling me that abortion was good for women. There are various types of women. And some women are careers oriented, and it's very important for them to be able to study, get a degree, start a career, and then have children. And for those women, it's, it's, it's certainly true that, that abortion was crucial and, and their utility has been improved. But there are women who don't want to go to, uh, to university. There are women who want children. There are two women who want plenty of children. Actually, there are women who will never use abortion, say, for religious reasons. Is it so obvious that those women also gain from the legalization of abortion? In other words, even if you tell me on average they gain, is it so obvious that each and every woman gain, or is it the case that some women, some women gained a lot, but some women lost, and actually some of them might have lost a lot? Especially, uh, there is a marriage market, and, and a, a huge change like legalization of abortion must have had an impact on who marries whom, uh, and, and how the surplus is shared, and so on and so forth. Which was a very good point, and if in order to address this kind of issue, you need a theoretical model in which you take matching seriously. So we wrote a matching models, and it, which, we, which is interesting because the matching here is not on income, it's on preferences. So we take seriously this idea that women are heterogeneous with respect to their willingness to have a child, and we, we build a, a matching model using the kind of technology that we saw there. Now, the funny part is what we found, the conclusion of the model were extremely clear cut. The nice thing with this model, and they, they give you a clear cut conclusion. You may or may not believe it because you need strong assumptions. But, but the conclusions are, are in general clear cut. And the conclusion were, A, all women benefited from the legalization of abortion. And B, women were unlikely to use abortion who actually benefited on average even more than the other women from the legalization of abortion, which is a kind of interesting. Now, I don't have time to tell you exactly the story and present you the model and everything, but it's a, it's a, it's a JP paper in 2006. But it gives you a good idea of the power of this, those very simple models. They have a lot of predictive power. If you're willing to, to buy the assumptions, you can get a lot of mileage out of them. There is their paper on children and divorce. Uh, there is a paper about male and female demand of higher education. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this one because I think it's important. There is the dynamics. We, had, we were talking about divorce and uh, what's the impact on divorce laws. Uh, and you know, my reply was, was something like, 
uh, if you want to think about the impact of divorce law and intrahousal relocation, you need something like an explicit model of, of matching. That's what this paper is doing. So that's um, that's a paper. There are a bunch of paper about multidimensional matching. I don't think I will have time to talk about them, but they are. And then there is matching with imperfectly transformed utility. If I have time, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. So let me take, now I'm concentrating about this one. Male and female demand for higher education for two reasons. First, I think it's a very interesting question. And second, uh, I'm going to talk about not only about the theory, but also about empirical issues. Let me start from this. I don't know if you're familiar with this kind of graphic. Uh, on the horizontal axis, I have years starting in 1968 and all the way down to 2006. On the vertical axis, I have the percentage of the population aged 30 to 40 that reach a given level of education. Red is for women, blue is for men. This guy up there is reaching some college. This is college, and this is more than college. That's uh, master degree, uh, law degree, PhD, whatever. So for instance, this point here tells you that in 1986, 20% of men, if you take the male population aged 30 to 40, 20% uh, had the college degree. Now, one thing you see is, look at this period here between 1980 and 2004. One thing we know for a fact is that the college premium has been used, has been increasing a lot over that period. Now, the college premium is defined as the wage you get with a college degree divided the, 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 by the wage you would get without a college degree, right? Which is not so easy to measure because you have to take into account selection into college. But uh, that some, there is a huge literature on trying to measure the, the college uh, premium. And all this literature is telling you, over that period, college, the college premium increased a lot. And actually, the college pre uh, plus premium, so the, uh, the premium you get not from a college degree, but from more than college, like, like a master, uh, PhD, or something, increased even more. We're economists, we believe in incentives. So we expect that if you increase the return to, uh, on an investment, people will invest more. There is this huge increase in the return on, on investment in higher education. You should see a behavioral response whereby people invest more. And actually, you see that some. Look at the female curve. The percentage of, female, of, of women with uh, this college plus degree in uh, 1978 was something like 3 or 4%. In 2004, we're at 12%. That's a multiplication by a factor of three. That's huge. There is a huge behavioral response here. But what's a bit disturbing is that you don't see anything like this for men. If anything, it's flat. Now, if you're a bit more specific, what you realize is that actually the college premium starting to increase a little bit more, a little bit later, if you take into account precisely, there is something like a very weak response for men, but, but, but not much, and there is this huge response for women. Now, that's sort of surprising, right? Because you got agents faced with exactly the same incentives, and you see that some of those agents, women, respond big time, whereas others basically don't respond. They respond much less. And by the way, that's not a US phenomenon. You see the same in basically all Western countries, and not only in Western countries. One of, if I was asked, you know, what are the main, the, the two main economic trends, the most important economic changes in the world over the last 30 or 40 years, I will certainly not mention the crisis. I will mention first the, the, the huge decrease in world inequality, the fact that hundreds of millions of people have left poverty over this, uh, mostly in China and India, but also in Brazil and other places, and actually in some African countries, uh, have been uh, moving out of poverty, which is a huge phenomenon. And the second one, probably as important, is the huge increase in female education, which it takes place in every, not only in every Western country, but actually in basically all over the world. OK, 
Okay. Now, I'm not going to talk in general, but, but here is the puzzle. You face men and women with the same incentive. Why is it that women respond a lot and men don't respond or respond much less? In the paper I was alluding to, so it's uh, AER 2009, here is the, the answer that we want to, that we, that we put forth, and I will not, so, the, 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 the paper is based on an explicit model. I'm not going to talk about the model. I'm not trying to write the equation because I want to concentrate on the empirical aspect of this. Uh, so let me just tell you the story. And believe me, there is, there is a model behind this. And if you're interested, you can go to the initial paper. But here is the story that we've done. The impact of education is twofold. So why is it what you gain by uh, investing in education? The obvious thing is, is you get some benefits on the labor market. If you, are, if you have a college uh, degree, your the wage will be higher, you're less likely to be unemployed, uh, your career prospect will be better, and so on and so forth. That's true, that's fine, we know that. Uh, the problem is there is no significant difference between men and women in this respect, and if there is a difference, it's, it's, it's probably favoring men uh, more than women, if only because women, men are more likely to work than women still now. So uh, this definitely does not Im imply while well, women are responding much more than men. The point we make in the paper is there is something else which is often forgotten, but which is also very important, which is what you get on the marriage market. By acquiring a college education, you're completely changing your prospects on the marriage market. You're changing the probability that you will get married. You're changing the education of the potential spouse and the income of the potential spouse. You're increasing, even for a given education of the spouse, the size of the surplus that you're generating and the distribution of this surplus. And this we call the marital college premium. The marital college premium is the additional gain you get on the marriage market in addition to whatever you would get on the labor market. So what you get on the labor market, you will get it pretty much whether you're married or not. There is a slight difference between between single men and, and, and married men, and there is a, a slight difference between single women and married women, but not huge, and nothing that could explain the huge the response difference that we see. But in addition, there is something that, that, that should be taken into account, which is the fact that if you invest in education, it completely changes your prospect on the marriage market. And the point we make in the paper is the, college, the labor market college premium is pretty much symmetric between men and women. But it might be the case that the marriage market uh, on the um, uh, college premium is completely different for men and women. And what we do is we construct a structural model which is not estimated, which is more or less not even calibrated, which is simulated using some kind of parameters, in which we show that the magnitude of those effects could explain what's going on. So essentially, the, the claim is the total college premium should be the sum of the two. and. Uh, there is a huge discrepancy between genders regarding marital college premium, and that's explained the difference in, uh, in education. Now, as I said, I'm not going to, tell, to show you the equations, but let me give you a one, one sentence summary of the model, which, which is due to, uh, to someone I admire a lot, um, with, uh, uh, namely Bobby Solo. Bobby Solo is the wife of Bob Solo. You know, you know Bob Solo is a is, uh, is a Nobel laureate uh, from MIT, and his wife. His wife is a, is is a very interesting person. First, she's a wonderful person, but in addition, she's an exact counterexample to everything we know about marriage and education. Uh, she's now in in her 80s, so she she graduated some something like uh, 55 years ago, and if you look at at edu female education at that time. First of all, very few females were acquiring a PhD. She did. Many females acquiring a PhD at that time were remaining single. She married. The ones who, mar who were marrying were very unlikely to have children. She did have children. And the ones who married and have children were very likely to stop working. She continued working, and actually she, uh, she, she was a professor. So she is a, a, a perfect counterexample to the um, to, the, to what we observe about the labor market of educated women 50 years ago. 
and I, I, I had the privilege to be sitting next to her at, at, at a dinner in, uh, with friends, and I started saying, you know, you're example, counterexample of the kind of, of model that I'm working on, and she said, can you explain me your model? And I started to make this kind of clumsy, clumsy explanation, and at some point she actually interrupted me and she said, well, let me try to summarize your, your, your model and tell me if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm right. And she gave the, the best summary of, uh, of my model that I've heard so far, which is the following. She said, in my days, so uh, graduating 50 or 55 years ago, it was OK to be a nurse from, from a marriage point of view. Marrying a nurse, uh, being a nurse was, was OK. Actually, it was great. Because you have a very high probability of marrying a surgeon. But nowadays, if you're only a nurse, forget about marrying a surgeon. Why that? Because there is too much competition from female surgeons. Well, that's exactly the way this model is working. There, there are some additional ingredients. I mean, the, as always, the technical aspects are a bit more complex. But it's something like, nowadays, where many women are educated, actually, you know that women are more educated than men on average in the US and in, and, and in Europe and so on and so forth. But a situation like this, if you're uneducated, uh, your marital prospect, and in particular the, pros the probability that you will go marry up and the division of um, and the division of the surplus within the household and so on and so forth, are much more, uh, much grimmer than what they used to be 50 years ago. And of course, that means that the return to education are much higher. Whereas for men, it's pretty much the opposite. Uh, if you had, if if you didn't have a, a, a college degree, but 50 years ago it was very, it was unlikely, not completely unlikely, but quite unlikely that you would marry up to an educated woman just because there are too few of them and they were they would marry educated men. Whereas now it's much more likely. Okay, that's the story. Uh, those are the details of the model, but I don't want to enter into the into it. But let me just talk about the empirical implementation. And actually, I'm going to talk about empirical implementation of those models in the case of these models of education. But the kind of issue that I want to raise are more general. The question is, how do we take those matching models to data? Now, here is what the, what the basic problem is. Those matching models, they are nice, but they are way too mechanical. They give you a perfectly assertive matching in a completely deterministic way. They tell you the wealthiest man marries the wealthiest woman, and the second wealthiest man marries the second wealthiest woman, and so on and so forth. That's not what we see, obviously. We do see a correlation. And actually, we do see even more correlation now than, 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 than 30 years ago. I'll, I'll come back to that. We do see a correlation, but we don't see this kind of exact matching. Why that? One explanation to be could be there are frictions. You know, and then let's move to a search model. In that case, you just abandon the frictionless framework. But there is another explanation or another approach that will preserve the frictionless matching. But I will say, well, the frictionless matching, as, as, as we're using the years so far, is way too simple because it's disregarding an observed heterogeneity. The one-dimensional model in which people match based only on income, on, on income is way too naive. We want something much more, much richer. People match on a bunch of characteristics. It's, it's certainly not true that you can summarize the situation of a person on the marriage market just by this person's education or income. There are plenty of other aspects. You know, uh, what the, age, physical attractiveness, charm, you name it. Now, you're not, we're not going to write a model of, of charm or physical attractiveness, obviously. But we're going to do what economists do in those kind of situations. We're going to call that a random term. There is some kind of an observed heterogeneity. We don't observe them, but people observe them, and they match on that. How do we introduce this kind of an observed heterogeneity in those matching models? This is exactly the way we think about this. It's not the only way, again, you could use a search model, and you can use a you can use, as you well know, you, you can use an observed heterogeneity both in the matching model and in the search model. There is a very interesting research agenda which is trying to compare what you get from the two approaches on similar problems. And, and, uh, but let me try to explain what, what the solution would be. 
Now, first of all, this S function. So I have Miss, uh, Mrs. I marrying Miss, Mr. J. The only thing I observe is something like education or income. But I know that there is something else. And the natural way of modeling this is this matching here as a component which only depends on the education and then some kind of random shock. Let me just describe the mathematics of a model like this. I have a matching model. I have a surplus function. But this surplus function, instead of being deterministic as before, is now random. What's, what's changed in this kind of framework? Well, here I'm going to use a lot the intuition that uh, match stability in a matching model is equivalent to surplus maximization, because it's much easier to think in terms of surplus maximization. Now, remember, let's go back to the basics. Mrs. I, as an outcome of the matching model, will have, will have a utility, which is UI. And Mr. J will have a utility, which I call VJ. In the deterministic setting, those stuff will be deterministic. If I, if I introduce some kind of randomness, now those guys will be random. So I will have conditional on the on education, I will have a distribution of utilities. The people with the same education will have different utilities just because those epsilons are different. And, and, and that will be true for women, and that will be true for men. So I will have two distributions. Here is an interesting mathematical problem. I give you a stochastic surplus maximization problem like this. It's still a linear problem, so I have dual variable, but now those dual variables are stochastic as well. If I know the distribution of the primal model of this epsilon, what can I, what can I do? What, I, what do I know? What can I derive about the distribution of these dual variables? And the answer is, we don't know. I've been talking with, with a bunch of mathematicians, among, uh, including the best specialists in the world of those kind of optimal exploitation model. In general, it's a very difficult problem for a bunch of reasons. But you know, if you're telling me that those epsilon are normally distributed, and let's say independently distributed, which I, I will definitely not want to assume. I'll, I'll come back to that. But even if you take them to be IID, those distribution of those stuff is extremely difficult to find. Now, we can do something alternative, right? We could say, well, we have those, those, those random variable ui and vj. Uh, but we know that there is a bunch of inequality that they, uh, that they must satisfy. Why don't we use these at moment conditions? And those of you who are familiar with the industrial organization know that this, this, this is done a lot. In, if you look at the, the new trends in, industri in the econometrics of industrial organization, there are plenty of situations in which, uh, you, for instance, when you have set identification, uh, you, the, you identify the, the, the theory does not give you a characterization of one equilibrium, for instance, because there is no such thing as one equilibrium, the model has, has multiple equilibria, but you've got moment conditions that take the form of inequality, and we know how to identify model using inequality. So why don't we do that here? Well, we could, but look, it's unlikely to succeed. Why that? I have one inequality per potential couple. So even if I have a small population, let's say 2,000 men and 2,000 women, that's not a huge sample. But now I have 4 million inequalities. You know, even if, I, if, I have, if, if my uh, estimator is quite powerful, uh, 4 million moments condition is not something that I'm, I'm very likely to, uh, to deal with. Plus, the main problem is not this. The main problem is that out of those 4 million conditions, 2,000 of them are equalities. And the remaining ones are inequalities. And I don't know which ones. So that doesn't sound very promising, right? So in practice, it's not feasible. So instead of, so if I try to address the problem by brute force saying, I just take a surplus function and I put an epsilon here, what do I, what do I get from that? I don't go very far. Instead of this, let me try to specify a structural model. So let me try to be a bit more precise by what I mean by those kind of unobserved characteristics. And here, I will introduce assumptions. Those assumptions, as always, will be debatable. But what I'm, I, will, I will try to be very clear about, A, what assumption I need to put, and B, 
what, what kind of mileage I get, what, what do they buy me, okay? So here is the model that, that we take to the data. The first thing, I have a finite number of education classes. College, uh, high school dropout, high school, some college, college, college plus. That will be five classes. In practice, we use three, but that's, we have that for men, we have that for women. And then we assume that what's the, what does the utility look like? I have exactly the kind of utility that I was alluding to with this uh, generalized quasi-linear form that I was alluding to. And then I have a random term. Now, what's this random term here? What's interpretation? Let's take a female I. This female I draws a vector of, a, of preference for marriage. Some women really want to marry, some women don't want to marry, and in principle it could be the case of some women really want to marry an educated man, where some, some women don't care. Think of this as taste. Uh, some women like classical music and they want to, to marry a, a, an educated man because they are likely to go to concert, whereas some, including educated women, they like baseball and they can marry an, an uneducated man because uh, the uneducated man is, is, is likely to go to a baseball game. Whatever, you know, that's, I know that, that, that's a bit uh, caricatural, but, but think of this like this. So the point is, each female draws a vector of preference and this vector is random. And this alpha is what's my utility, my random utility of marrying a husband in class one all the way to a husband in class N. And that depends on I. The crucial thing is I want the distribution of this alpha vector to depend on the female education. Why that? Because at the end of the day, the female education is endogenous, and there will be a bunch of selection taking place here. In other words, if a woman draws a random turn that makes it very likely that she will be willing to marry an educated man, then, it's, then the return to education for her will be much higher and she's more likely to invest in education. So because of this endogeneity, I definitely want this the distribution of this vector to depend on the education class of the woman. I do exactly the same for men. Uh, and then the surplus now is just the sum of utility. I still keep my, my, my general quasi-linear utility function, so efficiency requires maximizing the sum of utility. And the sum of utility will be the UI here plus the, the, the utility of the wife plus the utility of the husband, which have exactly the same functional form as before, plus the sum of those two random terms. Now, this sum of utility, now what we're assuming here is that you match once you've acquired your education, but before your income is realized. It's, we're talking about lifetime income, so there will be plenty of randomness on future income, so you match on the expectation. So you cannot, the surplus is exactly the surplus that depends on income that I was describing in the, with the factual form that I was using before, but that's something that you cannot observe. So what you use is the expectation of those stuff based on education. So, if you look at the surplus generated by the match of Mrs. I with Mr. J, there is a, a component, which is the economic component, which is the expected value of the surplus conditional on education, which is something that I can compute using my functional form. But the point is, this, is, uh, this depends only on the two education classes of the husband and the wife, and in addition, I have my preference shock, or my female preference shock, and my male preference shock. And then I have a simple uh, uh, normalization, which is that everything is zero for symbols. I don't have time to talk about the normalization, but it so happens that that's a natural normalization. Okay. If you think of it, this looks a lot like the model that I was using before. So it's a, a deterministic part plus an epsilon. But with the additional property that the epsilon now, in my structural interpretation, is the sum that something that it depends on the identity of Mr. I, but only the class of the husband, and also the identity of Mr. J, but only the class of his wife. The miracle is, this is something that's sufficient to give you a very precise characterization of the distribution of the UI and BJ. Remember, my motivation, initial motivation was I'm, what I want to, to get, what I want to estimate is the UI and the VJ. How much, how much of the cake he's getting, how much of the, of the cake she's getting. So those, the dual variable of my model exactly answer this question. I mean, in this beautiful situation in which I have a very abstract 
conceptual tool, which is a dual variable, which exactly answers my very practical question, how is the shear, how is the cake divided between them? But the problem I had is the, the UI and BJ were random variables, and I had no clue what their distribution looked like. The miracle is, if I have in addition this property here, then all of a sudden I know what the distributions are. And by the way, this very deep intuition was in an early paper by uh, Aloysius, uh, by uh, uh, Eugene Chu and uh, Aloysius Sayo, which was published in uh, JP in 2006. It was not expressed that way. And actually, if you read the paper, it's a bit confusing because uh, what I'm telling you is not what they're saying. But that's exactly the intuition. Uh, and let me give you the main result. If you have large population in each class, then there exist numbers, which I call U, capital I, capital I. Now remember, capital I is an education class. It's the education class of the wife. And capital J is the education class of the husband. There are numbers U, I, J, and V, I, J, such that U, I, J, and V, I, J add up to Z, I, J. Now remember, Z, I, J is the deterministic part of the surplus, the economic part of the surplus of, Mr. of someone in class I marrying someone in class J. And it only depends on the education, because at the moment they match, the only thing they know is their education. And then the utility of Mrs. I is this U I J here plus alpha I J. And the utility of Mr. J is this V I J plus this beta. So what you get is a systematic part, which is endogenous, and then we, that, and, and then we, we will have to, to solve the model for but which is the same for everyone, with, with, for every couple in which, uh, in, in which the husband and the, and the wife belong to a, a given education class. And in addition, I have a random term, but the random term is just the initial random term that I have in the preferences. Which means that if I assume, for instance, that those guys are normally distributed, then the UI is normally distributed. Obviously, I will never ever assume that alpha I is normally distributed. Now, let me. Are you, are you still with me? Yeah. I know that it's a long morning, but uh, it's a long evening for me, actually, here in Paris. But are you OK? You're surviving? Let me ask you a question, just to, uh, what kind of functional form assumption would you make? What kind of distribution for the alpha would you take at that point? Any suggestion? Normal? Love no more. Ha ha. That's that's better, but it's still not the answer. Okay, bear with me one minute, and in one minute the answer will be obvious. We have another suggestion. Uh, type one extreme. Yes, go ahead. Type one extreme volume or. Ah ha! Great. Absolutely, that's the right answer. It's not so obvious to see there. Let me give you the intuition. Remember my stability condition. There is a max there. Remember, u of x is the max of something. It's the max of x of xy minus v of y. Whenever you have a max, you need nodes that are stable by the max operator. And type 1 extreme value distribution are, I mean, like essentially, the, those are the, 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 the distributions. So it meant, intuitively, it's, it sounds sensible, but it's not completely clear to see why. Well, look at this. And now you see exactly why. If I'm wondering, I'm asking the following question. When, uh, let me take a woman, I, belonging to an education class, capital I. What's, when will this, this person marry a spouse in a given class, J? And the answer she is she will marry only if the UI she gets by marrying someone in class J is larger than the U, the, the, the U she would get by marrying someone in any other class. That's my max operator. So essentially, the condition is what she get, the UI she gets here is more than what she would get as a single, which is normalized to zero, and also what she would get by marrying someone from any alternative class. Look at those equations. Those are the standard equation of a discrete choice model. So the miracle here is. I had this very complex problem in which I had matching. So I had a bunch of inequality for each person i n, for each pair i j. All of a sudden, it boils down to uh, just a single 
just a set of inequality for each person. And this you can estimate using a logic. So I'm going to take uh, singlehood as a benchmark. I'm, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to take, I assume that they are extreme value distributed. I will use a logit. And the beautiful thing with the logit is that I will get extreme value distribution, which is exactly, uh, with extreme value distribution, I know. Now, remember, what's my expected utility? My expected utility is something like the max next year. And the, the great thing is that the extreme value distribution is, I, I have a close form solution for the extreme value distribution, which is exactly this. Now, I have some identification problem. I definitely don't have time to talk about the identification problem. Uh, but one way to do that is to estimate the model. Now, let me tell you how you can estimate this model. I'm going to be very, very quick on this. In the end, what we're interested in is the evolution of marital pattern in the US over the last 30 or 40 years. Okay? Now, how, how, how are we going to deal with this? We're looking at a bunch of cohorts. What happened for each cohort is that they were playing a matching game, and it was a different matching game at each co for each cohort. Why was the matching game different? For two reasons. One is maybe the uh, the surplus function has changed. Remember, the surplus function is reflecting something that has to do with household, intra-household decision, household production, and so on and so forth. The technology of household production has changed a lot. Uh, you know, there is this very interesting idea is coming from papers, the, 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 the a paper which is called Engines of, Lib of Liberation by um, by uh, uh, by uh, Mehmet Yorokoglu and uh, Nezi Gunner and, and, and a bunch of people, uh, which tells you that uh, yeah yes thank you uh, I'm starting to be a bit tired so <laughs> yeah thanks Steve uh, but it's it's a paper that makes a very interesting and I think deeply true remark, which is that the technology of household production has changed a lot, and this must have had a huge impact on the situation of women, which and those models are completely compatible with this. But essentially, it means that the, the insight is, in the old days, 50 years ago, there was a lot of return to specialization because a lot of time has to be, st has to be spent to household chores, which explained that you had a lot of household in which there was complete specialization and the wife was not working. Now it's much less the case. And, uh, and so there is much more space for women to enter the, the market, which he actually was in, the, uh, in our AR paper. I didn't, I didn't have time to talk about this, but that's part of the, of the structural model that I presented. So the, what's the economic translation here? This Z guy here, which remember is the economic surplus that you derive, must have changed over time. But even without this change, the distribution has changed a lot. Remember. This is a matching model, so a lot depends on the distribution of male and female by education. And this, we know for a fact, has changed a lot. So we have several cohorts playing different games. And the intuition here is pretty much the same as the kind of, uh, of intuition you've got. Again, in industrial organization, that would be something like the relationship between macro BLP and micro BLP, if you're familiar with, with the Barry Levinson Baker's kind of model. There is a lot that you can learn if you compare different markets, uh, if, and if you assume that something is common among those markets. We're going to do exactly the same here, and we're going to assume that something is common across those markets. Now, what's common across those markets? Definitely, it's not the Z, because we know that the surplus has changed. But we're going to assume this. What we assume is that, despite the fact that the gain from marriage has changed, we assume that the supermodularity of the gain of marriage has not changed. There are two ways of thinking that in plain English. One would be to say uh, the preferences for, for assortative matching are still the same. It's not the case that people like more assortative matching now or benefit more from, uh, gain more from assortative matching now than they used to do 50 years ago. 
There is more authority matching, of course, because there are more educated women, so there are more educated women marrying educated men. But it's not, not a change in preferences. Another way to say that is the surplus generated other, uh, within the household by education has changed a lot. Now, if you're educated, in a world in which you don't need to spend five hours a day doing chores, you just need one hour because you have a washing machine and a dishwasher and, 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 uh, and you name it. So there is, there is a huge surplus because now you can go on the market and work and there is a huge gain. Of course, this gain is specific to education. Educated women probably benefit much more than this than uneducated women because what they can do instead of staying home is, is go on the market and the wage on the market is higher for them. But what we're said that this, we're assuming this is this is there, but we're assuming that this gain does not depend much on the on the education of the husband. That's exactly the assumption we're making. This this idea that the supermodularity is constant is exactly that there is there are some gains. These gains depend on the education of each partner, but they don't depend on the cross education. The gain for an educated woman is not larger when the husband is educated. Now again, it's an assumption. Good news is testable. Because now you have a model, if you make this assumption, the model is vastly over-identified, so we can identify everything and we can test, and we can make specification tests. I don't want, so these are the basic Z values, and you can, so essentially what you estimate is the Now remember the Z, we have three uh, education categories, which is high school dropouts, high school graduates, uh, sorry, uh, and, and college. Uh, we have something which is the, um, the surplus generated. So this is the economic component of the surplus. In addition, there will be the random component, but the economic component is the expected value of the surplus that will that will be generated initially, given that we, there are trends and those stuff will change across time. But but this is the initial value. And since the supermodularity doesn't change, the, the initial supermodularity uh, is the same at, uh, is, is maintained throughout time, and what you can see, those are the outcome of the estimation, uh, and those are the surprising thing is this just come from the estimation of matching patterns, right? This is very strongly supermodular. Take any top, for instance, take this two by two matrix here, one, two, three, four. You compute the sum here minus the sum here. This is positive, and this is true for any kind of two by two table that you can extract from this. We got some variances. I don't have time to talk about this. Um, but so look at this. This is the joint surplus from diagonal matches. So how much surplus do you get if you marry someone who's like you? Of course, we estimate everything. So we estimate the expected surplus that you get from matching someone who has the same education and someone who's less educated, someone who's more educated. right? So this is the estimator of the surplus. That's for uh, college educated people, that's for high school graduate, and this is from high school dropouts. First of all, the benefits have been declining all over, all, 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 have been declining constantly over the period, which is exactly the engines of liberation kind of story. But B, it has declined much less for educated people than for uneducated people. Now at the surplus, it's that there has been there so there has been a decline in the gains of being married, and that by the way, that you see big time in the data. How do you see that? Because people marry much less now than, than 30 years ago. You know, in this kind of model, if people marry less, it's that the gain for marriage are, are going down. We see that in the data, the model confirms it, there is no big surprise here. But what we what this is telling you is that the, 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 the decline has been much less steep for educated people than for uneducated people. Uh, now, as I said before, if you acquire a college premium, it changes the probability that you will get, uh, get married, it changes the education of your, the expected education of your, of, uh, of your spouse, the surplus and the distribution of the surplus. Since we have a structural model, we can do the, we can explicitly compute all this and do that for the old cohort and the new cohort. I don't have time for this, but this is essentially the expected value of the UI. So remember, the UI is the, the small UI, which is the dual variable, is the economic, economic systematic part, 
plus the expected value of the alpha, and the expected value of the alpha is not zero because the expectation of it's the expectation of a max, right? So it's it's strictly positive and it depends on everything. Uh, and this is the this is what we get. Now, just to summarize the meaning of this, we can compute the expected utility that you get for any kind of for any level of education. Again, the expected utility has two components. One is the economic component, is the expected surplus, the expectation being taken on your future income, conditional on your education. And plus, there is this uh, taste of random shock parameter, which is the expectation of your alpha or your beta, conditional on the fact that you're going to choose someone who maximizes. So this has a, a positive value, and you can compute the, the value of this, the expected value of this. That's exactly what you get here. So that the expected, so you can I can compute this expected utility, this expected gain for educated women and for non-educated women. The difference between them is exactly the marital college premium. Is how much more do I get by being educated within the marriage? Remember that in all those computations, we normalize the utility of single to be zero. So in addition, there is the fact that being educated now would, would give me a higher wage than being educated 30 years ago. But that's true for single and for married people. And this is, this is normalized away from the from your equation. That's exactly the marital college premium. Those are the raw results from the estimation. So the red line is for men, and the green line is for women. And what we see is that the education the, the marital college premium has basically not moved for men, but it has increased a lot for women, which is exactly the kind of theoretical explanation we had in mind. Now, this explains the fact that women were much more willing to acquire education than men. What's interesting is, in, in, in order to estimate this, we never ever model the education decision themselves. We just model the marriage decision. So there is the Again, I'm, I'm, uh, I realize it's a bit frustrating because I'm covering uh, two papers, actually, which are sort of complex in, 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 uh, in, very, in a very short time. Uh, how much time do I have, Steve, now? 15 minutes, am I right? Yeah, 15. OK, those are the kind of extensions that I was planning to talk about. And uh, one thing I must, I must say is the people here, you know, you, might, you may know I'm, I'm currently sitting in the Paris Center of the University of Chicago. You know, the University of Chicago is a beautiful center in Paris. It's small, but it's absolutely gorgeous. And you know, being in Paris at that time of the, of the year is, is, is not too, uh, too bad. Uh, but today is the 13th of July, uh, which is the day before Bastille Day. Uh, tomorrow is the is the most important uh, bank holiday of the year in France, and what I'm doing to those poor guys is I'm forcing them to stay here. It's now basically 7:30 p.m. and on the eve of, uh, of Bastille Day, I'm forcing those guys to stay here just to be to be here and help me if I have a, a connection problem and close the door after me and so on. So I must say the people here at the Chicago Center have been. Absolutely wonderful, and please thank them a lot uh, at some point while well, they're not here in the audience, so we, we cannot give them a, a round of applause. But uh, they, they have been incredibly nice and helpful uh, in this in this process. Now that said, I I have to leave at 7:45 because I, I think forcing them to stay until 7:45 p.m. Uh, on the day before Bastille Day is, is sufficient. Uh, is a sufficient, uh, is a severe enough punishment. So I won't have time to, to, uh, to talk more than 15 minutes. So essentially, I'm not going to talk about multidimensional matching at all. Sorry about this. I'm going to briefly talk about imperfectly transferable utility. Uh, and I, I, I won't be able to do much, but I will just give you a, an intuition of what's going on here. And empirical implementation, I've talked about enough about this. So let me just forget about multidimensional matching. And let me now move to inter in imperfectly transferable utility. What's the motivation here? As I told you, there, is, there are good things and bad things about transferable utility models. Good thing is, there are transfers. I believe in transfers. I believe that there is redistribution taking place into the couple. I believe there is inequality into the couple. And I believe that this inequality is endogenous. Those models allow me 
to account for this kind of redistribution within the couple. And they allow me to identify, to pin down from a theoretical point of view and to identify from a, from a empirical point of view what's going on within the couple. That's great. I love this. So those are a great model. But there is a price to pay. And the price is sort of high. And here is the price to pay. As I told you, if you assume transferable utility, you immediately assume that all Pareto efficient allocations correspond to the same aggregate behavior. So what I can tell you is, over the last 50 years, the situation of women has improved a lot. And the share of also resources that women are, are, are getting is much higher now than it used to be 40 years ago. But what I cannot tell you is, as a result, the structure of consumption of the household has changed. And in particular, say, women in, are investing much more on children. Now, I don't know if it's true in the US, by the way. Uh, there is this prejudice that if you give more, more power to women, more will be spent on, uh, spent on children. Uh, the only study that I know trying to take that to data is a Dutch study that concludes that it's not the case. That actually doesn't make much of a difference. But one thing I know for sure is that if you look in developing countries, that's something that we've seen a lot. We've seen that in South Africa. We've seen that in Mexico. We've seen that in, uh, in various places in Africa, and so on and so forth. So this idea that if the condition on the marriage market change, in such a way that the respective position of women is increased, this will have a huge impact on children, on how much is spent on children. That's something I believe is true. And at the very least, I want to be able to explore. Problem is, if I want to look at this, I cannot use a transferable utility model. Why that? Because the way I will model conception of children is something like a public good. The, uh, the husband and the wife decide on how much they spend on the children. And the utility of the children enters both utilities. So technically, it's a public good. If I'm assuming transferable utility, I'm immediately assuming that whatever the, the respective power of the husband and the wife, the same will be spent on, on the public good. So I'm assuming that any change on the marriage market cannot possibly it can have a huge, change, a huge impact on the, on the inequality between the men and the women within the household, but it cannot possibly increase the amount spent on children. And that, for some models, is a very poor assumption, because that's exactly what I'm interested in. So I would like a model in which there are transfers, but those transfers and the change when I move along the Pareto frontier, this has an impact on how much is spent on the public. The models I'm going to show you now do exactly this. There is a cost. They are slightly more complex. On the other hand, they are not untractable. I will, I'm going to show the theory to the best of my knowledge. They have never been, been taken to data. And actually, the, the econometrics of it are, are, are still to be done. Because essentially, the econometrics of it would be everything I did in the linear setting previously had to be done in a nonlinear setting. You'll see that in a minute. OK, so what do I want? I want a model in which transfers are possible, transfer are central. But the exchange rate is not constant. Right? If, I, if, if the exchange rate is constant, it's transferable utility. I have this, 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 this invariant property that I don't want. So essentially, in practice, what I want is there is a Pareto frontier, but it's not a straight line. So now my Pareto frontier is some function p. So u of x is some function p of, uh, of v of y. And this function is decreasing, concave. And also, it depends on x and y, which simply tells you that if you increase EF, male or female income, you inflate or deflate uh, the Pareto frontier itself. Mm -hmm. But this, this, this P now is not linear. In the transferable utility case, this, this P function was linear with respect to V, actually. It was a function of x and y minus V. Now it's not linear. It's more complex function. I still have the same stability conditions. So it's still the case that uh, stability has this very simple translation that U of x is larger than this guy here. What I'm losing is the equivalence with maximization. Remember, the transferable utility has this wonderful theorem that stability was equivalent to surplus maximization. Now it's no longer true. And actually, it's no longer true for a very good reason, namely that I cannot even define surplus maximization, because I cannot define a surplus. To define a surplus, I need something. I need this guy to be linear. I need this p function to be a function of x, y 
minus v of y, and then this function would be the surplus. But with this nonlinear setting, I cannot even define aggregate surplus. So I cannot even give a meaning to the uh, maximization of aggregate surplus kind of situation. But I can still use the same kind of approach. And let's try to see how far we can get with this. Now, stability, as I said, the stability is u of x has to be larger than this for h, x, and y. If it's larger, it must be larger than the, than the, than the max. Uh, but actually, it's equal to the max because it, I have an equality when they're actually married. So I'm using this. And I'm just using the first order, the, the first order condition of this maximization problem, right? And maximization with respect to y gives me this. By the way, how many of you are familiar with contract theory? Uh, adverse selection in uh, adverse selection models with a continuum of time. Because okay, not 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 so many obviously, but uh, for those of you who are familiar with this. You, you will have an impression of déjà vu, because it's, it's exactly the same technology, the same kind of computations uh, applied to a different framework. But we're going to introduce Spence Morley's, and, and it's going to do pretty much the same as it does and what, than what it does in, in, in this kind of models. So assume that I know who marries whom. So let's assume for the moment that I have a sort of match. By the way, I had simple condition for assortative matching, which was the, the Spence Morris condition, the second cross derivative, in the transferable utility case. Now it's no longer the case, and it's much more complex. At some point, I would like to be able to derive condition that will guarantee that I have assortative matching. But I don't have that for the moment. Anyway, that's what I get at this point. Now, just note that here, I have this equation that be, can be written that way. Now, the p function is, I know, because that's the shape of the Pareto frontier. It's, it's given by the nature of the problem. And the phi function, I know, because it's who marries whom, but if I have authority matching, this is just given by the distribution. So I have a differential equation, and I still have the fact that the v function, I just need to integrate this differential equation. And this integrating this differential equation will give me the, 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 the intra-also allocation, the way the, the cake is divided up to a constant, and then I will, I will be able to decide that the equilibrium condition tells you exactly, pin down exactly how the cake is divided, is still true here, from a theoretical point of view. The only problem is, it's a bit more complex, because if you look at this equation here, now it's a true differential equation. My unknown function is v. On the left-hand side, I have v prime, and on the right-hand side, I have v. So I need to solve a differential equation. And that's a bit more complex than before. It could be the case, for instance, that this differential equation doesn't have a close form solution. Of course, I can still numerically solve the differential equation, and that's a piece of cake. I mean, solving a differential equation is not difficult those days. Now, by the way, well, how do I get? What time is it? I could get conditions to get to get assortative matching. I use exactly the standard tricks. It's on my slides. You can look at them on my slides, but I don't have time to talk about this. But let me just conclude. I have been my remaining five minutes using a very specific model. I want to write a model in which I would characterize what's going on. And there are two things that I want to, to, to capture. The first thing is I want to capture the fact that if I change the powers, if I give more power to the wife than to, uh, with respect to the husband, this has an impact on the expenditures of the public good. And the second thing is, I want to capture the fact that women care more about the public good. And what I have in mind is really women care more about children than women. So I want, uh, I want to describe utility functions such that that will translate this fact that the value of the public good is not the same for men and women. Now, I'm going to do that using very specific utility functions, which are here. The husband, I get something which is just called Douglas, so that's completely standard. CM is private consumption, Q is the consumption of public goods, so it's really how much we spend on children. But the utility of the wife has this kind of shape. So there is a minimum private consumption. But beyond that, she's completely altruistic in the sense that an additional dollar can be spent on herself or on the children she doesn't need. She's so altruistic that she values the utility of the children or the expenditure of the children exactly as much as she would value their, uh, the same dollar being spent on her private utility. So I'm putting an extreme form of altruism on the wife's side, whereas I'm putting some altruism, but, but a standard one called Douglas on the husband's side. 
Okay, that's the Pareto frontier. I don't have transfer utility in the Pareto frontier as this J. And what you find is that if you increase income, you inflate the Pareto frontier. You can write down all those equations. It so happens that you can integrate them close form. You will believe me regarding the computations if they are not too difficult. But I end up with something like this. Uh, well, let me just give you the comparative statics because I think that that's sort of cool. So I'm assuming that the distribution, let me start from a situation in which the income of each wife is 80% of the income of the husband. And now I'm going to change this along two scenarios. Now what I'm going to do is, in both, in both cases, I'm going to increase the outcome of, I'm not going to change who marries who, so the couples will remain the same. I'm going to change the wealth of those, of those couples. But I'm going to do that in two different ways. In, in simulation one, I will increase the, the income of each female by 25%. So if initially he had one and she had 0.8, now they both have one. In the second simulation, I'm going to increase his income by 20% or income remaining constant. So 1.8 initially, now he got 1.2 and she gets 0.8. In both cases, the total income of the couple is the same. And by the way, this implies that in a transferable utility framework, those two models should have exactly the same implication in terms of expenditures on the public. What I would like to check in that in this kind of model, it's not the case. And I would expect that in the first situation, in the first scenario, uh, in the first scenario, so under transferable utility, I should have no impact. But there is change in powers. And I would expect that in the first scenario, uh, more will be spent on the, on the public good than in the second one. Now, I just discovered there is a big catastrophe on my diagram. So this is the crucial diagram. I'm sorry about this. But let me tell you what, what it's, uh, but what, what, what this is, is doing. And actually, it's pretty much the same message as, as this one. What you find is indeed what you would expect. Those are models in which if you, my two scenarios are equivalent in terms of wealth, but they are quite different in terms of intra-also inequality. And they're also quite different in terms of investment in public good. And let me, I'm done with my presentation, but let me, let me come back to my, to, to the question, the, the, what I call the conceptual question that I was asking at the beginning of my talk. I said, look, measuring inequality, we might be able to do that. I, think, I hope I convince you that using the two approach, using the uh, household per household approach, and also using the equilibrium approach. And actually what we're working on is an approach that will use both of them to over-identify we can say a bunch of things about what's going on within the house, including in sophisticated model in which we have public good, including in sophisticated model in which we don't have transferable utility in the narrow technical sense, in which we have imperfectly transferable utility. So that's, we can say something. But then we're back to, to our initial conceptual problem. And I want to conclude on this. We're going to find that in some situation, she gets more private consumption or she gets less private consumption. So we're going to see that there is more or less inequality between them. We're also going to see in a model like this that there is a difference in terms of how much is spent on children. Should we look at inequality in income or inequality in welfare? The huge cost of looking at inequality in income is I'm missing a large part of the story. Because in this model here, what you're going to see is whatever the model our private consumption is the same. Not just because I put a lot of altruism. Essentially, whenever there is an additional dollar that she can spend, she's going to spend it on the public good because that's efficient. She doesn't care about her private consumption. She, she likes exactly as much the same dollar spent on the children. And of course, the husband benefits, so it, so it should be. So if you change a lot in this kind of model, if we change a lot the power of the situation of women, her private consumption will not change. But the public consumption will change, and her utility will change a lot, because she derives most of her utility through the public consumption. Now, of course, I'm not saying this model is realistic. It's a very extreme case. It's just made to illustrate that point. But coming back to my initial question, definitely, if I just look at inequality in private consumption without looking at public consumption, I'm missing a huge part of the story, and that's something that I don't want to do. So again. It's not, it's not hopeless, but you need a real structural model of what's going on within the household
to explore this, this is something on which we've been working. Me and a bunch of co-authors have been working on this. That's, that's a boom in literature. And uh, you've got the references to, uh, to look at this if you're interested. And of course, if you have any kind of questions, send me emails. I will be more than happy to answer. Is there any, kind of, uh, any type of final questions? Uh, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs>